Welcome to our annual teaching training day um, and a special welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Mark Brown, who will help us launch the topic of this year's teaching day, preparing students for the future. I've been looking forward to this event and attending this event with you and I'm pleased, pleased to see that so many of you have chosen to come here today to reflect on how to prepare our students for the future. To de develop our teaching competences and to get inspiration, to get input and to move in new directions are extremely important in higher education today. We know it, we hear it all the time from the ministry, from the industry, from the media. We continuously need to uh, improve the quality and relevance of our study programs, as they say. So developing teaching methods, having competent and dedicated teachers as you are, are of great importance to the quality of our study programs and of course also to the motivation of our students. Import, uh, improving the quality and relevance is also of importance in the new strategy of the university. Um, as you probably know, we are in the middle of implementing the strategy called Knowledge for the World. And in the strategy, we emphasize our dedication to continuous uh, maintenance and further improvement of our study programs. And in do so, doing so, we focus on the key characteristics of Auburn University, of which problem orientation is, of course, a unique part of the entire raison d'etre of Auburn University. And it's our ambition that the principles of problem-based learning continue to be the primary and pedagogic um, format of all the teaching activities at Auburn University. And that's essential, and there's no discussion about that. But we also know that in order to improve the relevance of our study programs, we constantly must consider the way that the impact of new types of students, the impact of new staff members, uh, altered physical surroundings. We talk about the lack of group, group facilities, but we must think in other, uh, in other technologies and other needs and how all this may affect our approach to PPL, of course. It's also explicitly stated in the strategy that we shall consider new ways in which IT can become an integral part of problem and project-based learning. I hope that we can all use this day to <coughs> reflect on our own teaching practices, of course, but also to help us or, or use the stage to assist us in investigating how PPL and IT can be joined in meaningful ways. And we can look at exciting examples later on in the workshops addressed in the programme. Last but not least, a big thank you to the organisers who have been doing a great job to organise and put this event together for us with uh, <coughs> guests from outside and dedicated members of staff presenting their own uh, projects for us. But now we shall direct our attention to the theme of today's event, preparing students for the future. Thank you very much for the word and I look forward to participating in this day as far as possible with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Inga. Uh, my name is Catherine Otrell Kess. I'm uh, welcoming you also very warmly to today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many of you and, uh, and also very rewarding uh, to see that uh, people are attracted to the activities. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, today's keynote speaker, uh, Professor Mark Brown. Uh, Mark is uh, the director of the National Institute for Digital Learning at Dublin <coughs> City University. I know Mark also in his function as uh, chairperson of the steering committee of the ECIU, which is the European Consortium of Innovative un uh, Universities, of which we are part of. And so I have uh, 
listened to a number of very inspiring presentations, which also lead me then to ask him if he was prepared to come and share some of his insights with us today. So I very warmly uh, uh, welcome you and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone, and it's great to see such a full room of people ready to hear a little bit about teaching and learning in, I suppose we could call the digital age. But true to PBL form, what I'm going to do today is try to problematize the whole field of new technologies in education. This is not a simple or complex, uh, not a simple, but rather very complex area. And so my um, subtitle, The Future Is Not What It Used To Be, borrowed from several sources actually. Some of you may know the original source. It's not a uh, Yogi Bear who's frequently cited <coughs> as being the origina, original proposer of this, is really intended to have two layers to it, um, which I'm going to tease out at, um, various occasions through the presentation. But it's not, I hope, just a static presentation because I do want to do a amount of engagement with you and we're going to do an activity um, on a number of occasions depending on how time goes. So just be prepared for a bit of paper to come along and um, for you to need to just take your eye off your laptop or your mobile device for a period. So the future is not what it used to be. Um, that quote um, really came to my mind when I saw this newspaper article that actually found its way around the world. This is just one of the many sources um, that picked up on it just recently. Uh, I think it was February or maybe March, possibly the dates on the slide. Um, this was a secondary school, a high school in Australia, a very traditional school that decided that, and you'll see that I've identified in the box there, that we find having laptops and iPads in the classroom inhibit conversation. It's distracting. Now, I'm not sure, but I suspect this would resonate with a number of you. It can be very distracting, especially when in a situation like this. But on the other hand, I kind of think that um, these sort of almost moral panics aren't dissimilar to this um, one here where we used to talk more because someone invented fire. <laughs> fire being the technology. Now there's a delicate dance or romance between the extent with which technology drives society, a very deterministic, technologically deterministic view, versus actually technology is part of society and people shape and drive the nature in which technologies are used. Um, it's actually neither of those, it's a combination. We cannot deny that the iPhone that I have in my pocket, um, and it was the iPhone when it first came out, as a technology fundamentally changed my life and the things that I could do. But there are many other examples we have where we've used the technologies in ways that are quite different from how they were originally envisaged. So um, in many respects, what I try to position my own work around is the sense in which the future is something that we're not just entering, we all have agency and we can shape the future. It's something that we can create. And I suppose in higher education and universities in particular when we're faced with many, many challenges, it's very easy to um, find this just too hard. But I think this is the reason we need to be engaging and discussing and grappling with what the opportunities are and where some of the threats might be as well. Because if we don't, it could be done to us. So that particular kind of ethos about creating the future, I, I like sometimes to make a distinction between being a future maker as distinct to a future taker. I don't see the work we do in universities as just taking a future from someone else that's being presented to us. If anywhere in society were to shape a better future, universities have to be the engine of that. So I was attracted um, to Dublin City University only two and a half years ago to establish the new National Institute for Digital Learning. And Ireland is a very small country of four and a half million people. So one of the attractions was the ability to really, in a small country, make a difference, driven by that ability to make an impact or contribute to something. Um, so that's where I am now, um, and Dublin is a very dynamic city to be working in in the field of new technologies interfacing with education because 
for reasons that are somewhat controversial. We have Apple and Google and Amazon and Microsoft and LinkedIn. Um, controversial if you're not aware of it because the corporate tax rate is extremely low and in fact Apple I believe places now about 60% of their income through Ireland um, and the tax that they pay is very, very small. Um, it's even less than what they're expected to pay. Of course, this is an issue that the European Commission, I believe, is now trying to grapple with. And some other elements around the taxation or avoidance of it are in the headlines at this point in time. But I want to just start, um, before I get into the content of my presentation, by um, helping you out a little bit, because you might be struggling to say, if you haven't read my bio, what's that accent? I used it in an Australian example there, so maybe that was a cue for you. No. You would offend me greatly by calling me an Australian. It's like calling a Canadian, if there are any Canadians in the audience, a North American. Well, actually, they, North America is part of Canada, or Canada is part of North America, a citizen of the United States. So I have come from New Zealand, and in many respects, countries like Denmark and the Scandinavian countries have a close relationship with New Zealand in our philosophy, our thinking about education, um, although that has gone in different directions in recent times. I don't have time to elaborate. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this image. Those of you who are not familiar, that's Hobbitville. Um, which could be a typical New Zealand if there are many of you, and I suspect there'll be a good number who have come to New Zealand on more than one occasion, hopefully. Um, that's a typical rural scene in New Zealand. You can't see as many sheep as there would normally be because we have about 60 million sheep in New Zealand, <coughs> uh, four and a half million people. Um, and I'm often asked, how come then, having worked in New Zealand for a long period, born and bred in New Zealand, a very proud New Zealander, um, did I move to Ireland? Well, I've given you a taste of some of the professional reasons and it's a very, very creative role that I have to be able to work with some of the industry players that um, I've referred to and also a very innovative university, just like your own university as an ECIU member. But then on the personal side of things, which is why I've got this slide, we have four adult children. You can't really call them children anymore, can you? Four young adults. Two of them, and this may resonate, if it doesn't, it might be still 10 years on for you if you've got teenagers. Two of them were still living at home. There was no sign that they were going to be moving out. <laughs> so I discussed with my wife, Denise, we had to take some radical measure, measures because we could see 10 years on that we would still have them at our house. So we moved. <laughs> We thought they might be slightly disappointed, actually. They celebrated. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's a message for those of you who have teenagers, what you might have to look forward to. It's a modern uh, phenomenon that uh, they don't want to leave the nest. So um, another reason, and then I'll get serious in terms of the content of today's presentation. Um, in many respects, I'm going back to Ireland, and I say back deliberately because part of my family on one side left Ireland in 1876. Um, Fanny was 17 and Oliver was 21, and no one else in our family has ever been called Fanny, I'm pleased to say. But um, they were newly married, only three weeks, and I'll cut a long story short because it took 106 days to get to New Zealand. And when they arrived, they had to travel by two days, I think it was, by stagecoach, half a day by horseback, and then the final leg by walking. And that was the first time the indigenous Māori people had ever seen a European woman. And they were in a very remote part of New Zealand. By that time, Fanny was already pregnant with her first child. She went on to have 17 children. Um, 15 survived. And uh, I know this well because we've had a book recently published on our family history. There are now 850 descendants from Fanny and Oliver, and I am one of those. And I, I'm going to come back to that um, because this whole idea of creating the future, I can't but be inspired by what, in 1876, and the courage that it took for someone to travel to the other side of the world to create a better future. So, that's um, a little bit of my story, just to put a little narrative, because I'm going to tell in this first part in particular the story of the role of new technologies in education. 
and I'm looking around the room and as I look there are many of you that probably in the same generation as me who have lived through some of what I'm going to show you or talk about. Some of them are a little bit earlier and they're probably not anyone in the room that will have lived through a couple of the examples. For um, younger people, uh, and I don't want to put an age limit on that, um, some of this might be quite new. So I want to really see um, what are the lessons that we can take from the story of the history of the adoption of new technologies. The dream solutions, as I'm calling it, in the first section. Then I want to just explore some of the disruptive debates. You see, depending, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the rhetoric that finds its way even into the popular press, maybe even into the minister and government's um, documents around the disruption that is taking place through new technologies but other driving forces as well such as globalisation and demographic changes. So we'll just explore two or three of those but I do want you to engage in thinking as well which is where the activity comes in. And then the last part we're just going to look at some tools for thinking about how to redesign your course offerings, your program offerings, to take advantage of the affordances of new technologies, but also more traditional PBL approaches as well, not to suggest PBL is traditional. Um, I did pose in the abstract this question, um, which I only added this slide in the last stages of preparing this presentation because I reread my abstract, which is always a good thing to do. So I thought, well, if I've posed this question, I suppose I need to answer it. So I will endeavour to answer the question when I come back to it right at the very end. But this is the kind of framing reference I want to think about and ultimately try to answer. Of course, without giving you the answer now, there's usually many more questions and answers. But to some degree, um, what I'm grappling with in this presentation here um, in helping you reflect on your own teaching and the role that technology might or might not play is this rhetoric reality gap or sometimes refer to it as what people say is the state of the art versus the state of the actual because when we really boil down in some of the claims and what we're told is going on and we have a look and I'm talking now about some of the research evidence what really is happening there is often quite a gap and the image there, I guess, is what we want to avoid you know, as a metaphor. So the, fast, the last thing I want to do before we get started, where I'm going to hand over to you shortly, is just to give you a health warning. Um, what I tend to do is deal with big picture um, issues and try to work on the large landscape so that you can then reflect on that and think what the implications are. I'm not going to give you many handy hints for teachers. Um, so if that's what you're expecting, that's not what you'll get. That's your job, but also some of the workshops I know that will give you a lot more flesh, if you like, to elaborate on some of the ideas and concepts. So dream solutions, the first section. Um, now we'll see how we get on because we've got a crowded room here. And I have to talk you through this because I've been talking for about 10 minutes now. I now need to hand over to you for a brief exercise. So what's come around the room? And if you haven't got it, put your hand up when um, the moment's right and we'll give you a piece of paper. This can be a challenge. We'll see. You're a smart group of people, I can tell. It's early in the morning, you're at your peak. <laughs> what I want you to do is reflect on this question and with the piece of paper, and if you don't have a pen, we have plenty of pens and pencils we can hand around. I want you to write very briefly, and I'm only going to give you a minute once I tell you to go on this. Just one minute. I want you to write your response, and when you've done that, see how the image, um, and hopefully this word translates for you, is in a concertina fashion. Turn the piece of paper just to cover the, what you've written because later on what we're going to do two or more occasions we're going to hide what you've got and then hand it to someone else and that's going to be added to. So we'll probably need to go through that to make sure again but basically right at the top of the piece of paper your response to this question and when you've done that fold just not fold the whole piece of paper over just enough to cover your response and then sit on it and I'll tell you the next thing to do. So there's the instructions, we'll see how you get on. What do you predict will be the single biggest change to higher education by 2027? 
For our um, folks at the other campus, you may prefer to, if you're not on the audio so we don't hear you, just have a conversation amongst yourselves, if you wish. If you don't have a piece of paper, please show your hand. We'll make sure one comes around. So the clock is ticking, no more than a minute. And unfortunately, saying that you will be retired doesn't count as an answer. <coughs> Okay, I can see that some people have finished and I can just see a handful who have obviously caught the right instructions. If I just borrow that one for a minute. So you're just going to fold it over probably about that amount. There'll be two more occasions where we ask you to do this. So it's kind of like about a third will be good. If you've completed the exercise, your task now is to turn to someone either behind you or in front of you and hand it to them. They're not allowed, there's the most important thing, you are not allowed to open it to read it. You just have to sit on it. If I catch someone reading it, you'll be expelled from the room. <laughs> and if you wish, you can hand it on to someone else, as long as you keep one in your hand. So by the end of this, you should still have a piece of paper in your hand, but not your own one, hopefully. And hopefully you have not revealed or read what someone else has written at this point in time. Okay, you can keep finishing off if there's a handful of people still doing that, but let's now push on um, and we'll come back to these uh, at the end of this presentation. In many respects, if I was to answer that question 10, 15 years ago, I could have perhaps said the impact of, in some respects I was going to say the web, which is what this quote really clearly refers to, the World Wide Web, but it's perhaps more the internet that has been the disruptive force, um, the biggest disruptive force, of which the internet, or the web, World Wide Web, is a very p important part of. Um, and you can see the sorts of predictions that were made at the time, not. In fact, that quote comes from 1894 and the invention of the wax phonograph cylinder. But could easily have been an early kind of prediction about what the World Wide Web would be. Um, so I want to sort of ground, as I said, the story in some historical um, innovations of the past. This one gets well and truly used in, on the keynote circuit from Thomas Edison, and there's a follow-up one as well, which is more commonly known, but I chose not to use this. This refers to the, um, the invention of the videoscope and then ultimately the movie, um, the motion picture, and, and the extent with which it would transform education. I guess not, albeit we're being videoed here. And then, um, a lot of people don't appreciate that television was invented much earlier than it became a mass market product. So this um, quote comes from the early invention of the television and the impact that that would have on the nature of education and extending education to the homes of many, many more people. It may be too small for you to see on the screen, but I do think it's slightly ironic that even back in, I think this was 1935, where the blackboard was seen on the uh, image as still part of the delivery metaphor that one of the most common learning management systems or virtual learning environments still uses the metaphor of blackboard. Very interesting. Let's move on um, then a few years to the most uh, famous project around computer assisted instruction. Project Plato out of the University of Illinois and um, what I'm going to have to do here is a little 
tricky juggling act because we couldn't get my video to embed. So I want to show you a primary source video here, if I can navigate a PC for a minute, to give you a sense of the um, thinking of the time. The first, the biggest and the most ambitious assault on this problem has come from Project Plato in the state of Illinois, where a big computer has been hooked up to over a thousand terminals and where literally tens of thousands of students have been and are being routinely taught by computer. Now, the range of teaching programs available is enormous. Every student, of course, has personal tuition and some remarkable results have been achieved. This computer is the heart, or I suppose you should say the brains of the Plato system. By world standard, it's not a particularly big computer, but it knows the names of thousands of students and how well or how badly they're doing at any particular moment. It's also got in its memory over 15,000 teaching programs, ranging from rudimentary spelling right up to advanced clinical medicine. Most stunning of all, perhaps, is the fact that it goes about its business 24 hours a day without a single human being supervising it. It's totally dedicated, endlessly patient, and supremely tolerant. A teaching computer which is a staggering foretaste of the future of world education. So the claim there, the staggering, um, the future of the of higher education or education, clearly that claim was not something that was realised. We do not now fill people into rooms in the way that was um, originally proposed. But the thinking has not gone away. Very much so. In fact, the new platform for that kind of thinking is the World Wide Web. And there are plenty of examples of people being taught in this kind of way. Um, so moving on a little bit to try to put a little theory around what we understand from the history of educational technology. In 1986, Larry Cuban, who's a critic of the use of new technology in education, published this very small little book called Computers and Machines, The History of Technology in the Classroom Since 1920. And he said, from all the technologies, from radio, from motion picture, television, they all went through a similar cycle. One which began with very high expectations and bold promises of what this technology would do for education, how it would disrupt education. Followed by a period of the early adopters, um, the wireheads, sometimes I refer to them as uh, levels of support, early implementation projects to try and test the potential, to put it into practice, to realise the promise, if you like. And then Cuban said in his study that the third phase was this period of subsided enthusiasm, waning interest, where effectively people were now starting to question the technology because it didn't live up to expectations, and importantly, in most cases, it didn't mesh with the real classroom. It just didn't fit properly. The, far, the last stage, significantly from Cuban's perspective and maybe our perspective, was one of a period of rebukes and blame. And of course, the people who got the blame were never the technologists, never the technology, but the teachers and also the educational institutions were being stuck in the past and not willing to embrace change. Um, so this cycle is something that's used frequently in the literature. I personally don't like it, um, even though I've introduced it to you, because I think it's incredibly deterministic, and I don't think things work quite as simply as that. And um, in the same vein, I also don't like particularly the Gartner hype cycle, which is very frequently cited related to the use of new technologies in education and in other parts of society. But it is fair to say that technology enhanced learning, digital learning, whichever term we want to use, and of course the terms keep changing, which is interesting in itself, do go through this cycle of hype, hope, and then disappointment of some form. The challenge I have with the Gartner hype cycle, or the issue, and I've tried to just identify there in the bottom corner where MOOCs are currently sitting, um, the Gartner hype cycle, if you're not familiar with it, along the top you'll see that you begin with the technology trigger and the period of inflated expectations and then the trough of disillusionment. 
In the case of MOOCs, if you can follow the, the line across, they're sort of in between the trough of disillusionment and the slope then of enlightenment, where something ultimately comes out, but nothing that matches the original promise. Again, I don't like it because this is a very t deterministic sort of view. It's very linear and it's actually quite technocentric. It's focused on the technology and in some respects quite deficit oriented because implicit is the sense of it being resistance to change as to why um, technology is not adopted in ways that might be claimed. I much prefer a metaphor drawn from ecology where the focus is not on resistance but actually on resilience. And within an ecological environment, a species, if you like, gets considerable benefit from resilience. And resilience means you do take on features, you adapt. And if we think of a university as an ecosystem, which I think is a quite useful metaphor, actually we do know that universities and higher education organisations have changed greatly over recent times, actually over a long period. Um, but the adaptations that they've taken on have helped us to become more resilient and they can be very positive changes. That's not resistance. I won't take any longer going down that line, but I think uh, we need to shift our metaphors to a much more complex way of thinking and an ecological uh, metaphor where the interplay between a whole range of elements where if you change one thing, many other things change. That's how I see technology playing. It's not a simple implementation process around a technology. Equally though, just as in an, an ecology, if a species fails to adapt to the new conditions, it can become extinct. And in that sense, some of the claims that are made about the future of higher education may have some substance. Um, I want to test, nonetheless, come back to the Gartner hype cycle in the context of, and I'm not sure, I was going to give you the chance to tell me um, what you were writing down as you thinking the biggest impact I don't know, did anyone say MOOCs? Did that word come up in your thinking? Interesting. One, one or two. Um, this is a very famous, now infamous quote, um, because um, the person responsible just recently resigned in the, la in the last couple of weeks in his um, role. But making the claim associated with the uh, growth of MOOCs, the early um, period in which massive open online courses, because I shouldn't make assumptions, you all know what I'm referring to, um, were going to somehow transform higher education such that there would only be 10 institutions left. Of course, this would be one of them, obviously. <laughs> um, well, let's test the MOOC innovation, which arguably is the single biggest innovation in the last 100 years to have found its educational innovation to have found its way into the popular press. And I say that with some confidence because I've been involved in research on the way that media have been telling the MOOC story. Where do you see the media picking up on problem-based learning? And even in the early period and when problem-based learning was being proposed, you didn't see headlines in media. You didn't see the New York Times giving it as the innovation of the year. So the Gartner hype cycle, I'm testing here a little tongue-in-cheek. Um, I'm using Google Trends. If you're not familiar with Google Trends, you can type in anything and you get a trend of that. Try your own name. It might be interesting. My name's still tracking up, so I'm OK, because I've got a very <laughs> common name. <laughs> Um, so, on the basis of a Google Trends um, analysis here, for just the United States, where of course MOOCs really um, are the hothouse, there's some evidence, if we see this as a valid measure, of the Gartner hype cycle, and that MOOCs are indeed on the way out, or down. Um, and this uh, figure here comes from an annual report published. Sure, question? Okay, I did a quick qualifier because I wondered all of a sudden would everyone know. So what I'm meaning by, uh, thank you for asking, massive open online courses and partly it's because I just operate in that bubble. Um, uh, free online courses offered by platforms known as Coursera, edX, FutureLearn, um, and as you'll see shortly, I'll give you some figures on how many people are doing these free online courses. They have come out of the Ivory League elite universities, primarily in the United States, but we now also have FutureLearn, which is the UK-based platform. Um, and so this is one of the drivers around the growth of online learning, although that's a bit simplistic. 
So a search on any of those terms I've given you will give you more information or just a Google search on MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. Um, the figure here that I'm giving you comes out of an annual report published in the United States every year on um, what universities or colleges are expecting to do in relation to the MOOC movement. And you can see that despite a lot of what I was saying, the attention that these new free online courses have got in the media, only around 10 or 11 percent of universities actually offer them in the United States. Um, they are tending to be the more elite ones. What's interesting about this figure, and this is the most recent results out in February, is that more and more institutions are saying they're not going to do anything in this space. Which again adds some validity to the Gartner hype cycle that MOOCs have had their day. Having said that, um, to give you even more evidence, which is why in fact and the question you asked was very important why I paused before then in just a few minutes, because in Canada I was uh, doing an institutional review only about 10 days ago with a group of students as a group that met with us and I happened to ask them had they in registered or enrolled in any MOOCs and they had no idea what I was talking about. And this figure supports this, it comes out of the EDUCORS group, a very large survey of undergraduate students in the United States and if you can read as I'm talking, you'll see that very, very few undergraduate students, in other words, the young ones of today, have any idea what we're talking about in relation to online courses that are free, known as MOOCs. On the other hand, if I repeat the Google Trends search, this time for a worldwide search, you can narrow it down by country, um, it's a little more lumpy. And perhaps some suggest that's that there's a lag effect. The United States was leading the way and, and Europe's always behind, so you know there will be a, a catch up at some stage. I think it's very simplistic. And um, anyone who thinks that MOOCs have had their day and the bubble has burst and they will not be disruptive, I'm happy to have that conversation over the course of the day. Um, I happen to believe they have been disruptive and they will continue to be disruptive. But one of the points of evidence here is that from 2014 to 2015, the number of people, number of learners taking a MOOC has doubled. There are now 34 million um, people taking these courses. Um, and we expect that, that number will probably double again for the next 12 months. Now we know there are problems in the number of people who complete the courses and so on and so forth and who does the courses, but what this tells us is there's some demand here, there's something happening we shouldn't ignore. Wrapping up this first section, just conscious of time, just two quick final comments and this is in the context of MOOCs in particular and I'm just really picking on that as one of the most recent innovations is that we do tend to oversell the potential of a technology in the short term but underestimate its impact in the longer term, its wider societal impact. And one example I'll give you is that when, uh, this is called unbundling and I don't know if um, anyone has listed this as one of what they see as the major developments that will change higher education, unbundling. This is a huge body of literature around this, some of you may even work in this space in the business. Um, when iTunes unbundled the CD-ROM where you had to buy your music and you had to buy music on a CD, some of which you didn't want but you bought because you just wanted a couple of tracks, when iTunes came out and you could pick the bits you wanted, that's unbundling, that is what's being used as the parallel to what will happen to higher education, where people will be able to pick the bits they want as consumers. And I use those words quite deliberately. We'll come back to that in a minute. Final comment is I think the MOOC movement, which is part of actually something else that is much bigger, MOOCs are only a subset of what I would also have perhaps answered in response to that question, the openness movement. And the openness movement not just is about teaching and learning, it's also cuts into research. The requirement now for us to put our artifacts, our products of research into Creative Commons licenses. Many of us now choose to publish in open access journals. This is a very large movement. Um, driven with some interesting forces, competing forces. On the one hand, the principles of democracy and openness. 
On the other hand, the forces are around creating a free market, a market economy without restrictions. Um, enough said. So this quote here, often used, it's still got, what, 11 years to run? I kind of don't think the university is going to be f gone in 11 years. That would be my hunch. But then think about it. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have imagined some of the things that we are able to do now. And some of you may be aware of the wearable sort of technologies in the classroom, let alone the ones we're using for our own health. Just think ten more years on. So, I'm not going to stop at questions at this stage. I'm going to keep on going because I've got another activity in the next phase here, so I've been doing enough talk. The disruptive debates, and this is a relatively short section. So what I want you to do, you know the routine now, I want you to complete this, your answer to this question, you get a minute, and once you've written it on the piece of paper, fold it over again so it can't be seen, and then pass it on, pass it on to someone else, make sure that you're not giving back the one you've got to the person that gave it to you. So about a minute. The question is, what innovation will have the greatest impact on teaching and learning by 2027? It's okay to say MOOC, but maybe there are other things. And equally, if you can talk amongst yourselves, is probably the easier way to do this, I think. And I'm not suggesting that this has to be a technological innovation. Innovation can take many shapes and forms. So if you've finished, pass, pass it around. It can move several times. It would be nice to see if we can get one from the bottom right to the top by the end of this. It's just one more occasion. And of course, remember, you know you're not allowed to read it at this stage. So whilst you're just getting those around the room, the last ones, I'll just push on. And in this section, I just want to tease out three, just three potential disruptive debates. Um, and somewhat, again, in a problematic sense. One or two of the ones I've chosen might match what you've um, selected, but I suspect you have been more creative. But I've chosen in particular some that are very popular in the language that's being used at the moment. Remember, all of what we're talking about also needs to be anchored or rooted in the first section of the claims about new technologies and the impact they will have or not. So the flipped classroom. Does anyone here not have heard about the flipped classroom previously? A couple. Just a couple. I won't explain it in detail because actually I don't think there is a very clear definition, which is an interesting thing in itself. But what I found interesting in asking that question just shows you how quickly that concept, the flipped classroom, has found its way around at the academic community. I would say at least 80% of you have heard of it. So the lecture. It's pretty much what I'm doing right now, you know. And again, always a bit mindful when I use this slide because it gets recycled in a lot of <laughs> keynotes. If you look really closely, you'll see that there'll be someone asleep. There's someone talking to someone else. If they had a laptop, they would be answering their email <laughs> as well. Um, but the lecture has a long history. And I'm very conscious it's pretty much what I'm doing right now in a lecture hall or lecture theatre. And um, I can't see anyone, but then they might be hiding right up the back that's asleep because that was me when I was a student. I didn't really enjoy lectures and never took notes, but that's a separate story. I won't elaborate. I don't have time. 
The lecture has come in for, in the last few years, a lot of a bad rap. And I've got a slide here that comes from, I think, The Guardian in the United Kingdom, <laughs> saying effectively that the lecture should be ditched. It's a bad methodology. People don't learn. And then another one here, which actually I'll jump to the, um, to the reference, and these slides will all be available as well if you um, want to take down any of the URLs to follow them up. Out of the Academy of Sciences, this publication, National Academy of Sciences, this publication last year that uh, then found its way into the popular media, saying, and we have the evidence to show that the lecture is bad. But we still do it in a lot of cases. I know your PBL is very, very core to what you do, but lecturing still happens. Um, and here I am giving a keynote as a lecture. Well, I think we just have to drill down a little bit more deeply here. And in terms of the, even the study, which comes from a very reputable source, I think it has quite a number of methodological weaknesses. You see, I gave this presentation yesterday in Copenhagen, and um, the way I'm doing it today is quite different. I've got a different audience. There's just more people here. It's, it's not the same. So that's, and I'm the same teacher. But there is no such thing as the standard lecture. People will do it in different ways. So when we make gross generalizations like the lecture is bad, I think we lose sight of just how different, um, or different kinds of pedagogies, even within a methodology. I would make the assumption that PBL here has a huge range of ways in which it's interpreted and implemented for your discipline that's appropriate for your learners. So lecturing a group of 100 first year students will be very different from lecturing more senior students and more advanced. So I just want to point out if you see people talking about this, it's not what it might seem. And the other thing is um, the modern lecture theatre is very different perhaps even from the facility we're in right now. The modern lecture theatre, if you get the opportunity to influence your university when you're refurbishing develop, um, spaces, which I try to do in my university, typically allows lecture theatre seats to flip around. So the activity that we've been doing, you would be able to actually be able to more easily collaborate. But another technique in modern lecture theatres is to ensure that two rows are at the same level. And then when you flip around, you can do group work. People do group work in lectures. Um, it's just not as easy. But the modern space is designed fundamentally differently. So again, lecturing is not just the one methodology. And then very recent publication, if anyone wants a really more academic interest in the flipped classroom and what we mean by the flipped classroom, because I'm truthful in saying there is no common standard definition. And please don't take me wrong, I think there's a lot to be said in the idea of flipping the classroom and those who aren't familiar. It's about presenting the content maybe online and using the lecture for discussion, getting the students to do things rather than passively transmitting information. They can take that information their own way and then using the time more valuably. But there are lots of variations. This piece of work just published only a matter of weeks ago shows that the concept of the flipped classroom has its roots many, many years ago, almost a century ago. It's not a new methodology. So will the flipped classroom, tongue in cheek, have replaced the lecture by 2027? Um, I kind of don't think so. But the technologies we have might give us a whole range of new possibilities. And some of you might tell me later the exercise I'm doing with paper at the moment we could easily have done with mobile devices and using a cloud-based solution. The second one, um, learning will be mobile and accessible anywhere, anytime from your pocket. Universities are very often challenged because we're slow to adopt new technologies that the digital natives um, uh, uh, using this technology and, and this is again one of those kind of popular things in 1986 um, we used to dance at concerts but 2016 now they uh, click, tweet, video, share, so on and so forth. Um, these are in theory the digital natives and uh, if you want to subscribe to this view, most of us in this room would be the digital immigrants. 
Now, um, as a quick aside before I come back to the mobile focus, um, the literature about the distinction between digital natives and digital immigrants show that this is just not empirically true. It's just not accurate. The distinction is not generational at all. In fact, some of the most high-tech people can be very senior in age. So this is a very dangerous dichotomy, and most dichotomies are not helpful. Um, but it still gets used, including my own university president sometimes uses it, um, to capture the sense that we want to be a modern 21st century focused university. So the idea that the mobile is going to transform um, the learning experience, we've all got them. Some of you are probably answering emails and doing other things now. It has tr certainly transformed our life, if not our learning. On the other hand, like DCU, where I'm from, and my previous university in New Zealand, we use Moodle as our virtual learning environment or learning management system. And um, wherever I go, I frequently hear people say they hate the learning management system. It doesn't matter whether it's Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas, there are a whole range of them. It's a very strong metaphor for what's wrong with IT in the institution. Um, and when I hear this going to lots of different institutions, I know it's not the actual platform itself. It's something different that's going on. And the argument is that we're trying to put our students into this clunky system when they're elsewhere. They're on these devices, and I happen to pick up, there may even be some of the colleagues, co-authors in the room, um, the Network Learning Conference this week in the United Kingdom. It's a very, very um, theoretical and really good cutting-edge conference. There was a paper presented from some academics from the university talking about how your students are on Facebook. Um, I can point that reference out. And that's the reality. But of course, um, they're also in a whole lot of other places too. So the VLE is dead, was the argument in 2007 by Martin Weller. Well, I actually don't think the VLE is dead. It's just we've got to be careful that we really understand what it's about. And in some respects, this survey, again coming from the United States, but it's a very large sample that they do annually, so it's got, if not validity, reliability in the sense that it's repeated. What it shows is that academics, the teachers, or well, they would say instructors, not a term I would normally use, um, have much higher expectations of what they think we should be doing with technology than the learners. They kind of understand that this is a traditional environment and, and certain rules apply. Um, but moving on to my comment about the Moodle in particular, let's use, since that's the language you're using here and the platform, it's more like the bus. Um, I'm going to extend the quote here. If you think we were designing a city, designing this city, would you ever design a city, a modern urban city, without public transportation? whether it be a tram or a bus or a metro. You know, it's not a Ferrari. It's not going to look good when you're in there and wanting to look really, you know, cool. But it gets you from A to B. It's generally reliable. It's the backbone. It's an infrastructure that you wouldn't want to do without. And so that's, for me, where Moodle, the virtual learning environment, sits because students can submit assignments and do other functions. And you can do some reasonably creative things, but if that's all you're trying to do in the bus, it's going to be a bus experience. Um, so you need to embrace and look at other opportunities. So it's just a metaphor to kind of help you perhaps, not completely uh, in colloquialist words, slag off the virtual learning environment or Moodle. Um, and then in terms of some academic literature to finish off this section, I also just want to alert you to the fact, a very nice study out of Australia, looking at what learners actually do in universities. Their use of technology for learning, both in and out of the classroom, and out of the classroom where they have much more control over what they're doing, is actually very limited. It's kind of largely around surfing for stuff, often from Wikipedia which isn't as bad as it might sound either. But, um, so the evidence, remember my state of the art versus the state of the actual. Um, perhaps we should just talk to our students more to find out what they would like us to be doing. The last section on this, and then I need to speed up, um, <coughs> blended learning. Who hasn't heard of blended learning? A 
Canful. Okay, so it might be one of these concepts that doesn't translate um, as well into Danish, or um, you've just not been in, the, in that space. Blended learning has been become very popular as a way of addressing the so-called disruption that instead of um, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, to use an expression hopefully translates for you or you're familiar with, that all we need to do is blend the new technologies into the best of what we've always been doing. Blend the good parts of the technology into PBL. Now I'm saying this and you may detect, I'm not a huge fan of the concept of blending because I don't think it's particularly disruptive and I quite like the disruptive element because I think there are some things we should disrupt and challenge. But there's a standard definition of blended learning for you from the literature. And language is very important, I might add, just as you're digesting this. In my own institution, we don't refer to Moodle. Um, we refer to something of the aspirations we want from our, from our learning management system. We don't talk about the system in a technical way by its name. I'll come back to that. Here's a classic example of what many universities do. I'm not suggesting that you follow this model, but what it tries to visually convey is a semester is made up or a term of each week, and you might have a mix of lectures and PBL experiences or crits or seminars, tutorials, and you work your way through. And some people are successful and some are less successful in meeting the outcomes along the way, and then there's a final examination. During um, the weekly sessions, this sense of blending, a weak sense of blending, is you might be using PowerPoint, you might be using clickers in a lecture, different technologies, but they're not really that disruptive. Here's a, um, to capture the sense that blended learning, when it was first proposed, was intended to be very disruptive. It was meant to be an opportunity to completely rethink the way we teach and um, design for learning. And visually, this comes from the seminal book on blended learning and higher education by Norm Vaughan. And here's visually a representation of how blended learning using new technologies mixed with old pedagogies could be used to provide a more adaptive, personalised learning experience, knowing that some people already know some content, so why would they need to do that and learn it again if they've already got the competency? So there's more of a kind of pick-a-path approach depending upon what you know and the technology is providing much greater flexibility for learning and in some occasions even cancelling the lecture because you can get that material online from a video and other forms. So why I don't like blended learning is, and the way this is presented as a stronger form is not only is it not disruptive, it doesn't fundamentally challenge some of our assumptions because you know at the end, and I know the word exam means slightly something different or more broadly than I would use it, but at the end the students set a test, a formal examination, you see it there, like this. And at DCU, they do this, they're doing it right now, and the examination is normally three hours long, Yes, it might not be the whole amount of the assessment, but there's still a large amount of assessment. And you know what? They're not allowed to bring any technology in. Even their watches are banned now. Interesting response to technology here. I personally couldn't write for three hours. So for me, that's a very good test of how far we've really come in being disruptive. We're trying to fit the technology into a very traditional way of doing things. Um, if we were to embrace what we could do with technology here, and I actually don't mind having examinations in the way I've portrayed them um, in that sense, where there are times you have to show what you know in life. But why would we have to put everyone in the same room? They could do that from their home if we use the technology creatively. So, I think sadly, clearly not at this university, but sadly if I was to look on to 2027, and make a prediction knowing how dangerous predictions are, my hunch is that blended learning, in some respects that again famous uh, image, has an element of blended learning with new technologies um, showing pumping information, or as I put, pump, pump, dump. I think that metaphor could still exist in most of our higher education institutions. And if you want to read more in a very contemporary report on the whole concept of blended learning, and those of you who are new to it, I'd encourage you to take a look at this report. It just came out in February. 
challenging us to go beyond traditional views of what blended learning might mean. So those were just three examples that I just wanted to sort of unpack for you um, and in, in a problematic sense. And please do not take me wrong here. Technology has enormous potential to transform the teaching and learning experience when used well. Um, but I think the path of least resistance is to use it in ways that graft on to the ways we've always done things without challenging what we've done in the past. Final section, and I'll be as quick as I can, we want to start off with that. This is the final activity for you. Um, this is a little different from the other ones, and I just need to scaffold it a little bit. You see, one of the things that we know about, and I'll use blended learning, is what your fundamental understanding of teaching and learning, um, the kind of philosophy you bring, that's going to have the greatest impact on then your choices and how you use new technologies. So I just want you to take a minute to reflect if there was one metaphor or just two or three words that captured you um, to give you a bit of scaffolding. Sometimes people talk about seeing themselves as a coach, like a sports coach as a metaphor. So think about it. Is there something that comes to mind when you try to describe your own philosophy? And I'll come back to that. One minute. This is, might be what you write in your promotion application to describe you as a teacher, followed by all the more factual information. So again, make sure that you're left with one at the end because otherwise you might get shown up um, when we pull them all together. So as you're doing that, I will continue and just by share one of the metaphors that I use to think of myself as a teacher. And the metaphor is one of being a designer, but in this concept, it's a landscape designer. And I introduced to you the house that we still own in New Zealand at the outset when I had the image of our four adult um, children. And the garden that we have is a very large garden, which started from nothing. In fact, I'm very proud of the fact that I've planted 600 native trees and have created, as a designer, a real legacy maybe someone else will benefit from in years to come. So it's a very powerful metaphor for me, this concept of creating something, designing it, planning it. It didn't happen by chance. Um, and another element to this metaphor in describing myself as a teacher is particularly, and this is in the indigenous Māori language, land is really important with culture. And long after I go, the land will be left. So the legacy that I can leave as a teacher, and this is why this metaphor kind of works for me. Um, so I'll be interested to see what your metaphors are towards the end. The one key thing that I guess when I'm sort of unpacking this last section is even in the last five years, what it means to design a course, an individual course, or you might call it a module or a unit, and then the whole program of study has become increasingly complex. See, the concept of design is about choices. We have choices. And now there are so many more choices. In fact, we're overwhelmed with choices when it comes to what technologies we might use. Um, and one of the reasons I stuck with paper today for this exercise is because I wasn't sure what technology would quite work. And I wasn't sure what you would bring to the experience. But there are lots of other things I could have done. So learning design has become, a, 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 as well as a science, an art, and a craft that's really important in our thinking. Um, and people like Gronje Canole, who was the author of that previous slide's um, quote, 
uh, published a number of frameworks. This one's the seven C's of learning design that I'm just giving you examples if you wish to follow up. I personally find these a bit too linear, um, although Gronje does not suggest it's a linear steps, but I don't see it like that. I see design as a much more creative process, and if there was a metaphor I was to use for design, it's probably more like a jigsaw. I'm putting bits together and I move them around. Um, and in many respects, as Diana Lorillard says here, this is not a simple thing. It's actually much harder than rocket science, designing now for learning and for student success. Because our students are also coming with many different expectations and a different worldview than they did even five years ago. The other reason it's not easy is um, despite PBL and the strong literature base supporting PBL, this is a European project known as the Hotel Project. You can find the URL, I didn't squeeze it onto the screen. And this mapped all of the theories of learning and teaching. And look at them all. No one has a mortgage on the truth. These are theories. So there are so many different views. People have different philosophies, different understandings. Which of these are the ones that inform your teaching, your design? I like to keep things simple and I try to work in threes. That's about as much as I remember. So let me try to give you a tool just for you to reflect on your design and to what extent it's explicit in your thinking and your colleagues, those whom you work with. See, fundamentally teaching and learning just has three components to it. Interactions with the teacher, interactions between the teacher and the um, uh, sorry, interactions between the teacher and the learner, interaction between learners and learners, and then interactions with the content now in many different forms. That's the framework of the interactions that take place in learning. And whatever design you choose might put more emphasis on one than the other. Of course, we do now have new tools, but we also have new places and spaces for learning. So we have to bring those into the mix as well. Or you could rephrase those as there are different modes, there are different paces even of learning, so time has become a factor, when do you teach, and um, the place of learning, because it doesn't have to be situations like this, of course. Uh, at the same time, that framework doesn't necessarily give you a sense of the pedagogy, of the theory. So again, I like to work, when I'm working with <coughs> academics that don't have the theories, with relatively simple language, and I talk about the pedagogical compass that you might have. It probably will swing between periods of teaching by telling, or where the students are learning by listening, learning by making, which is um, a kind of constrict, cons um, a constructivist approach or constructionist approach, learning by doing and learning by sharing. Those are just some different elements. In your design, reflect on the design that you have for one of your courses. Where's the greatest emphasis? Because arguably all four of those points of the compass probably should be used in a really good design in various parts. Another way of presenting this is through an ecology metaphor, which I used earlier, but this time in a slightly different way. Um, we've got physical, physical and virtual environments. We've got sort of teaching by telling versus teaching by participation or learning by participation. And now we have four fundamentally different spaces for learning. Now historically in universities, we've tended to put the emphasis on learning in campus, sorry, on campus, in class, the one that's in yellow. But if we're now designing for what we understand where learning really takes place, three of those other quadrants all need to be considered in your design. I mentioned Facebook before. Actually, how Facebook is really, and what our students are doing, is not a lot different from what happens when they go off and have coffee or tea or whatever they do after your formal teaching. We now understand how important that is for learning and it's great that this university has lots of nice spaces for those conversations. Um, but of course we can use technology for learning off campus in class as well, synchronous or asynchronously. So I'm just challenging you in your thinking as typically we just focus on the yellow space. Now we've got to start thinking more creatively and consider where learning really is taking place. There's leakage across all of those. And where does the Moodle fit in this? What space is it best to be working in? <coughs> and then almost at the end, uh, very conscious of time, there's this concept of wrapping. Do you consciously wrap the experiences between one face-to-face -face session to the next and plan for that? 
whether it be an online or an offline activity. So this concept of learning design really starts getting us to think about these as conscious decisions, as choices we make, rather than when I first started university teaching, didn't even consider this wasn't my problem. So um, the last slide in this section before we wrap up is just to also alert you to the fact the choices you make, and of course the learner has a role to play here, have huge implications for the experience the student has. One small change to your assessment can have a huge impact on the learner for better and worse. My previous university, we used to ask our staff to use this little tool called a student workload calculator. It was a web interface. And we asked them to take one week of their course and put it into this calculator as if they were the learner to see what implications in terms of time and the mix of experiences the student would experience as the course. Because you see, if you chose to add a YouTube video to your course because you found something really good as an open educational resource, you don't have to make it, it's excellent, and you don't take anything away from your design, you've actually just added to the student's workload. And if you don't follow the principle of substitution, then you could end up, despite your best intentions and in digitising the experience in a really rich way, leading to less levels of student success or creating problems around student success just simply because of the overwhelming workload. So that's a cautionary note. Actually, when it comes to, um, this is the final slide, sorry, I forgot about this one. When it comes to metaphors of teaching, actually this is probably the one that resonates more than the garden design. I just wanted to show off my garden. Um, as a storyteller. And a storyteller not in telling a story in a monologue like this, but sitting around a campfire where old wise timers told stories to those who are young and just th thriving for knowledge and learning. Um, hearing the stories around the campfire, but also in the design of my courses, I also want caves where the students can go on their own in quiet periods of reflection to do their own learning. So the campfire for sharing and telling the stories and respecting the stories of others, not just my story. But then also the watering holes, I guess you could <coughs> see this as the water cooler effect creating the opportunities for informal learning outside here when we finish and are able to have a break. And lastly, mountaintops where you can celebrate the accomplishments of learning and share what has been done. Very powerful. So that's kind of where I come from more. Very much time to wrap up. Conclusion. Um, so my family left Ireland in 1876, as I told you at the outset, and I gave you a sense of which I'm in awe of what that would have taken, the courage that it would have taken to leave to go to another part of the planet where many people still argued that the world was flat. And at 17 years of age. And to then have created, if you like, um, and be driven with this sense of betterment, of creating better outcomes. Because the truth was, if they had stayed in Ireland at that time, I certainly wouldn't be here now, but their life, I think, would have been pretty grim. Because they didn't leave Ireland because they were wealthy, I can tell you that. Um, so I think there are some lessons here for us about having the courage to explore new spaces. We think that we are the generation that is creating and the, front, the new frontiers. I'm not quite sure that's the case um, in light of the historical example. And the last lesson is really, as I said at the outset, to be a future maker. This is for me the hallmark of what it means to work in a university, to prepare students who will be the future makers and shapers of a better world for us all, and not just a better country, which is a point I want to emphasise. You see, in whatever we think about new technologies, I really want to see them anchored in some kind of moral purpose, some grounding to understand that, and you can challenge the empirical basis of this work. But John Pilger, some time ago now, argued that despite all of the huge advancements in technology, and I showed you some of those, including television, and more recently the internet, the wealth gap between the rich nations and the poor nations has more than doubled. So when we hear that technology is going to solve these problems, I'm very suspicious, and this um, data from the World Bank was just published in February, showing that still less than 50% of the world's population has internet access. 
So we kind of think this is now just the new normal, but it's not the new normal. Yes, mobiles are advancing things quickly, but we live in a very uneven world. So I guess if digital learning is the dream solution, the problem it's addressing for me, you may have a different problem, is one of what's known as the Iron Triangle, promoting access to education, because we just know how transformative education can be, enhancing issues around or addressing issues of cost, who pays for this? And technologies can reduce cost. There's evidence, the MOOC is showing that. So there is something in the MOOC, but also enhancing quality. That iron triangle, something in there, but desperately what I think the world needs are more educated people, and that's our job. And I guess as I say here in this quote, if not you, then who's going to help us build or make a more evenly distributed world? That's what drives my interest in new technologies. And I'm going to finish on, um, on that note. I won't bother with the last video, because I think I'm up on time, pretty much. And what I do want to do in conclusion, that's what I will do. I do have a, one last slide that I might just, it's a nice one-liner that I should just finish on, if I can move beyond that. So in the same sense of what I've just been saying, which is not really a conclusion because I'm introducing a whole lot of new information here, but for me, the focus at the moment is too heavily on the technology, in this sense, the digital learning, or I could even say MOOC. We should need, we really need to shift our thinking to the big ideas. That's what we need to be thinking about. What is it that the technology will serve us for? and the mission that we have in particular in a university environment. Enough done, I've run out of energy and uh, my voice is drying up. Um, what I want to do in the final couple of minutes, I think we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm not sure we're going to have a lot of time for questions, is here's your opportunity, unfold the piece of paper, have a look at what someone else has said. And what I propose we do, rather than take questions, is give you the opportunity, I may have to report this back for the benefit of those on the other campus, we'll just hear from a few of you any interesting ones that come through. Um, anyone got something interesting? Do you need me to remind you of the questions? I can do so if necessary, but anyone got something interesting about that first question? What was going to change higher education that they think is worth sharing? Don't be shy. Remember, it's not yours, so you've got nothing to lose by sharing it. <coughs> Unless it's found its way back to you. Thanks, Catherine, with the mic. Yeah. No. Oh. Okay. We need a volunteer. Read all yeah. three of them out, otherwise I'll pick someone. <laughs> Uh, teaching will become a tutorial-like activity, freely available in the web. Hopefully the quality won't be degraded too much. And do you want to read the other ones as well we've got? Yes, there's not a number two, but there's a number three. Uh, designer, facilitator, conservator. Very nice. I like the last one in particular. Pass the mic to someone else and then they can't okay. ignore. <laughs> They're not yours, so. Well, I can say what I, I have on this one. It's, uh, so it's just multimedia or IT. And in your own case, what did you write for the last one? What was your metaphor? Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> okay. Anything else? One last one, maybe? What we might do is collect these in and then we can um, feed them back to you. This is quite an interesting exercise. Again, if I had used technology, I could have brought them up on the screen and I would have maybe um. had more engagement. You know, there are the odd lurker here, um, which is what you get, but I don't want to identify people. I, I have an interesting, actually, piece of writing. I don't know whether this is relevant. Here it is written, I do not have any teaching philosophy, an awful scholastic concept. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Final point, maybe I won't uh, bore you by reading out more, but we will collect them, so perhaps if we have somewhere at the front when you're coming out. Um, the, the point of the philosophy question is, the one thing we know conclusively from the literature 
is the philosophy you bring to the technology is what will influence how you use it. This is a very unique university because institutionally you have a commitment to a particular approach, I guess a philosophy, which can be interpreted in different ways. Not many universities have that. My university does not have that. So I think you're very well placed to be much more cohesive and strategic about the kind of choices you make in terms of technologies for the right ethos that you are trying to promote and the kind of student experience. Hopefully there was something from all of that. I was just going to suggest uh, that we might ask Espia mm -hmm. uh, sure. to, to yes. reflect on, on that. Thank you. It's always the challenge when you have another group, you kind of don't look at them and treat them as uh, second class. It's certainly not the intent. Do you have anything to share back? No, it's okay. We follow you. <laughs> well, at least we thought of you with some prompting. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Um, I hope there was something amongst that potpourri of things that um, got you thinking and took you from your mind space. And um, I think now is time. Do you have any announcements or do you want to? Right. Thank you. Stay. Oops, no. Please stay. <laughs> uh, I want, on behalf of all of you, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you very much for your presentation. It's certainly very inspirational, and of course, uh, it it reminds us if we want to really shape the, and influence the the future of our students, we need to be highly reflective and very selective in how we are approaching our teaching and also try and perhaps be innovative with the different uh, possibilities, old and new technology that, that allows us to you know, advance into, into new dimensions. So I would like to uh, use this opportunity to, you know, you have shared your <laughs> wisdom, I'm going to share a little Thank bit of much. our wisdom. And uh, so just a few uh -huh. small booklets. This is just uh, to share with you our uh, vision and also a summary of uh, PBL. what PBL is about. And uh, also a book, and this is wrapped up, but uh, it uh, includes, uh, well, the, the, I will reveal what the book right. is. So it's called Visions, Challenges and Strategies, uh, PBL Principles and Methodologies in the Danish and Global right. Perspectives. And it's edited by uh, very dear colleagues here, Lone Co and uh, Annie Arup Jensen. And uh, it also shows how significant and important uh, pedagogical thinking and uh, teaching approaches are thank to this university. Much. Thank you very so much. So thank you it's been again. An honor. And thank you.